borders, scars on the earth, anonymous graffiti on the south side of the border wall, Nogales, Sonora. No wall they can build, a guide to borders and migration across North America. Episode 8, Designed to Kill, Part 2, The Border Patrol, The Game, and The Desert. We were deep in the mountains near the border. There were seven of us. It was late afternoon and we'd been walking all day. We were in a deep wash, approaching a very heavily used migrant trail, when somebody shouted from the top of the hills above us. Hey, hey! Three people came running down the hill at full speed, cutting through cat claw and cactus and jumping into the wash. There was an older man, a younger man, and a teenage girl whose legs were covered with half-dried scabs and bleeding cuts. The older man pulled a Bible out of his pocket and threw it down open on a large rock in front of me. Philippians 4.13, he declared in English, pointing, I can do anything through the power of Christ which strengthens me. What? All three spoke at once. There were big dogs. They were biting people. They were pulling them down and biting them. They were screaming and they were biting them. What? Wait, what? I said. There were about 30 of us, the girl explained in perfect English. The Megiddo were waiting for us at the pass up there. They had dogs. They turned the dogs on us. And the dogs were biting people and pulling them down and biting them on the ground. People were screaming and bleeding and running in every direction. We ran down the mountain. They shouted at us to stop, but we kept running. I don't know if anyone else got away. This was how long ago? I asked her. 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Yeah, 10 or 15, the men nodded. We have to get the fuck out of here. Yes, she agreed. The 10 of us ran through the mountains. The older man occasionally broke out into song, sometimes Madonna, sometimes Beyonce, usually Shakira. I'm on tonight. You know my hips don't lie. He would pause periodically to demonstrate the veracity of this statement. You know, Shakira, it helps to sing. We passed a shrine where other migrants had left candles and bracelets and rosaries and offerings to the Virgen of Guadalupe. The younger man knelt, crossed himself, and said a prayer, nearly without breaking stride. After about two hours, we stopped in the side canyon and dressed some of the girl's wounds. How old are you? I asked her. Fifteen. I've lived in Oregon since I was two. I got in trouble. What am I going to do in Mexico? I've never lived there. I don't have any people there. I haven't been able to talk to my mom since I got deported. I'm just going to have to keep trying this until I make it. She's very strong, said the younger man. As for me, said the older man, it doesn't really matter. When I'm in Mexico, I live on the street. I come here, I live on the street. It's all the same. He's a nice guy, said the girl. There was a woman who was having a hard time keeping up. He carried her bag for her and told us jokes and sang us songs. We stopped again at dark. They ate and ate and the older man told stories. We're going to keep going, the younger man said at last. We're going to get some sleep and leave when the moon comes up. It's a very long way and it's easy to get lost, I told him. Do you know how to get there? I know exactly how to get there, he said. We talked about the mountains, and I could tell that he was telling the truth. Do you want to call your mom? I asked the girl. No, she'll just worry. I'll call her when I make it. I don't know what happened to them. A few days later, there was a small article in the Nogales paper about a large group of migrants who were deported with wounds from dog bites and needed treatment on the Mexican side. Nobody in the world, nobody in history, has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who are oppressing them. Asada Shakur. The Border Patrol. Allow me a couple of words about the Border Patrol. There is no government job that can be attained without a high school diploma that pays more than that of a Border Patrol agent. They are generally paid about $45,000 for their first year, $55,000 the next two, 
and 70,000 and up after that. They are not going around hungry. I don't know how to convey the extent of the abuse that I have heard migrants report at the hands of these agents. I have heard of agents beating, sexually abusing, and shooting people, as well as throwing them into cactus, stealing their money, denying detainees food and water, deporting unaccompanied minors, and driving around wildly with migrants chained in the back of trucks that look unmistakably like animal control vehicles, not to mention robbing smugglers and otherwise demonstrating extensive involvement in drug trafficking. Border Patrol is a lucrative business in and of itself, and part of that business entails exaggerating the danger of the job in order to milk taxpayers for more money. In my experience, law enforcement personnel in general consider their work to be truly perilous, believing that the world owes them a debt of gratitude and a fat paycheck. Since inception of the institution in 1904, 122 Border Patrol agents have died in action, 40 of whom were victims of homicide. In 2015, out of some 20,000 agents, not one of them lost his or her life in the line of duty. It is impossible to know how many migrants die crossing the border every year, but somewhere between the middle hundreds and the low thousands is probably a good bet. If you crunch the numbers, you'll find that Border Patrol agents are also much safer than roofers, sanitation workers, truck drivers, sex workers, and any number of other people whose jobs are actually dangerous. The other thing that any self-respecting Border Patrol agent will tell you is that they are protecting us from terrorists. This begs the question of who us is. More human beings have lost their lives in the desert as a direct result of Border Patrol activity than in every ISIS and Al-Qaeda attack on American soil combined. And quite possibly more than would have died even if every attack that the Border Patrol has had a hand in thwarting or deterring had been successful. The more important point is that as long as there is such outrageous global inequality, Americans are never really going to be safe. Many Border Patrol agents come from working-class backgrounds. Many are Latino. To be fair, I acknowledge that I have met some who treated migrants with respect. I also allow that, in fact, they do find people in distress sometimes, that some of these people would surely have died otherwise, and that some agents can be nice enough. The fact of the matter, though, is that it is rank-and-file Border Patrol agents who enforce the policies that cause all of the problems I am describing. No matter what they do individually, they will never be part of the solution as long as they wear a uniform, carry a gun, and obey orders. They could put the cartels out of business and end the death in the desert tomorrow, simply by going home. I've heard too many apologies for the Border Patrol. They are not the enemy. They are subject to the same economic forces as the migrants, and so on. I don't buy it. History is replete with examples of people who are willing to sell out their own people to save themselves. There were black slave drivers on plantations, Jewish police in the ghetto, native scouts leading the army after Crazy Horse, and now there are Latino Border Patrol agents in the desert. Sorry, but I'm not impressed. I think that when people become willing accomplices in atrocities, they just don't deserve much sympathy. Recently, a friend of mine found the body of a woman who died of some combination of dehydration, sickness, exposure, and exhaustion within a quarter mile of one of our largest supply drops, a place that I have personally serviced several hundred times. She had passed through an area where for months, a few particularly hostile Border Patrol agents consistently slashed our water bottles, popped the tops off of cans of beans so that they would go rancid, and removed the blankets that we would leave on the trails. As a result of these activities, we have had to move these drops around constantly and stop dropping at what would otherwise be excellent locations because the supplies will almost surely be vandalized. I believe that it is likely that before this woman died, she either passed a drop that had been vandalized or a place where there would have been a drop if it were not for the actions of these agents. I believe that it is very likely that if she had found our supplies, she would have survived long enough for us to find her. As far as I am concerned, the people who are doing this are murderers, and her blood is on their hands. Border Patrol agents really are scared, even if right now they don't actually have very much to worry about. It's written all over their faces. I guess destroying people's lives for a living must do that to you. There are few things under heaven more unnerving than the silent, accumulating contempt and hatred of a people, as James Baldwin put it. 
Personally, it gives me great pleasure to be able to go unarmed daily to places that people with automatic weapons and body armor are terrified to set foot in. I have not made myself an enemy of the people. And in the long run, that is going to keep me safer than them. In 2012, we caught Border Patrol red-handed destroying resources we put out for migrants in distress. At our wits' end, at their constant vandalism, we began to hide cameras in places where we knew they would destroy supplies. Within a matter of days, we had a video of a smiling blonde Border Patrol agent kicking down a line of water bottles in the middle of the summer, and of another using a racial epithet to boot. The epithet was Tonk, an everyday use within Border Patrol to refer to migrants. The word is derived from the sound a flashlight makes when you use it to hit someone over the head. The footage debuted on the PBS program Need to Know and circulated widely on the internet. The government looked bad. It did not go well with the administration's effort to pander to the Latino vote leading up to the 2012 presidential elections, and somebody up the food chain told agents in the field to knock it off. This simple action cost us $75, and led to a marked decrease in vandalism in the Aravaca sector that lasted until after the elections. This episode illustrated a truism that is also applicable to those trying to stop the police from killing black people. Only negative reinforcement will work on these people. If killing people has no negative impact on the personal or professional well-being of individual rank-and-file members of law enforcement, they will go on doing it forever. Changing law enforcement behavior means finding a way to exert enough leverage to bring about these consequences. We did this one way, teenagers in Ferguson did it another. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Deterrence is a two-way street. The hills have eyes, you cowards. The Game It's reasonable to hate everyone involved in the business of human trafficking on both sides of the law and border. The people at the bottom of the food chain usually end up doing the dirtiest work. Love the soldier, hate the war, as the saying goes. Love the player, hate the game. It's hard to say. Love the sinner, hate the sin? I don't know. The teenage boy from Sonora who leaves the teenage girl from Honduras to die in the desert is a black pawn. The Border Patrol agent who scattered his group and put him in that position is a white knight. You know this metaphor. They are all responsible for their actions, but somebody else set up the board. There's a game beyond the game, and it's clear who's winning. The players don't have to sit at the same table. They play into each other's hands. I worked in the desert for seven years. The Minutemen had no compassion, no vision, and no soul, but in some ways they were right. If the government wanted to shut down drug smuggling and human trafficking on the border, they probably could. They won't. There's too much money at stake. American politicians, Mexican politicians, border patrol, cartels, local police, state police, federal police, private security, DEA, FBI, SWAT teams, banks, employers, Bail bondsmen, lawyers, public defenders, district attorneys, judges, courts, county jails, state prisons, federal prisons, private prisons, weapons manufacturers, erectors of towers, builders of walls. Total surveillance infrastructure. Eternal war profiteering. The corporate state. The whole thing is a sick charade. They'll never cut the head off the golden goose. Don't bet on it. I'm done playing games with them. The desert. The desert is full of trash. Water bottles, tin cans, food wrappers, backpacks, blankets, shoes, socks, pants, shirts, hats, maxi pads, toilet paper. There must be hundreds of millions of tons of the stuff. Anti immigrant trolls love to talk about it. This is not because they actually care about the environment, but because they hope to confuse people who sympathize with migrants. 
It's like Bush suddenly taking an interest in the position of women in Afghan society back in 2001. You don't hear these people talk very much about the border wall obstructing wildlife migration patterns, or about the huge swaths of public land that are being leased out by the government to giant mining and ranching companies for a pittance, or about the depletion of the watershed as a result of cattle and urban sprawl. Unlike these characters, I actually care about the desert and have done my best to clean it up. I've hauled countless truckloads of garbage out of there, which is more than almost anyone on the opposing side can say. I tell new volunteers that as soon as they've picked up their first bottle, they've done more to deal with the problem than 99.99% of the Border Patrol agents, game and fish wardens, fish and wildlife officers, militia members, and armchair quarterbacks watching right-wing pundits on TV ever have or will. Border militarization has pushed migrant traffic into the wilderness. And consequently, it's getting trashed. If you don't like that, then we need to figure out some way to stop the border militarization. There is nowhere on earth like the Sonoran Desert. It is beautiful beyond telling. Wild, harsh, vast, mountainous, remote, rugged, unforgiving, everything you can think of and more. Many times that I felt weak, like I was going to lose my mind, I turned to its inhabitants for strength. The deer, jackrabbit, kangaroo mouse, stink bug, tarantula, tortoise, rattlesnake, raccoon, ringtail, quadamundi, pronghorn, javelina, raven, vulture, eagle, Coyote, mountain lion, panther, ocotillo, cat claw, shin dagger, prickly pear, barrel cactus, choya, saguaro, and even some of the cows, dogs, cats, and people. I could find our camp from anywhere between the Babokivris and the Atascosas, on foot, from memory, every time, without fail. I located myself between those mountains for a season of my life. The desert is full of places that are sacred to me. There's the last place I saw Esteban, the last place I found Alberto, the places where Claudia and Jose and Susana and Roberto died, Jaime's rock, Yolanda's hill, and Alfredo's tree. It is overwhelming to think that as many of the stories as I know, as many as anyone will ever know, that it is just a drop in the bucket of all that has happened there. The objects that people leave behind are a constant reminder of this to me, a physical manifestation of all of the best and worst that human beings have to offer. I am not a particularly spiritual person, but the weight of these remnants is immense and often oppressive. I love the desert. It breaks my heart that it has played host to such terrible suffering. It gives me some solace to know that someday, even if it is only because there are no more human beings left on the planet, there will be no more United States, no more Mexico, no more helicopters, no more walls, no more border patrol, and no border. The plastic will break down, the memory of these things will fade, and the land will finally have a chance to heal under the blue sky and the merciless sun. You've just listened to episode eight of No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America, published by the Crime Think X Workers Collective. Stay tuned next week for Episode 9, The North. This audiobook is a production of the X-Worker Podcast Collective. You can check us out at crimethink.com slash podcast. To order a print copy of the book, read a free PDF version online, check out the poster that accompanies the book, or to learn more about the anarchist struggle for a world without borders, visit crimethink.com slash borders. To learn more about No More Deaths and solidarity work in the desert along the U.S.-Mexico border, visit nomoredeaths.org.